afternoon, a privilege to, uh, to be able to uh, deliver a session here at uh, NUS. Uh, my name is Greg. I am uh, and the head of IT education at Optiva's Sydney office. Uh, I joined Optiva about eight years ago as a software developer and actually did C++ development uh, until I moved into the education team. And now I spend a lot of time working with our, our talent team uh, and reaching out to university students such as yourselves. So thank you again for having me. So what I hope to do uh, in the next couple of hours is basically give you uh, a whirlwind tour of C++. So my assumption is that you have some programming experience. Uh, so I don't need to sort of teach you the fundamentals of programming. So I can focus on the C++ language itself. Uh, so hopefully that's the case. Uh, in order to help you follow along, I've set up a, uh, a little test in the HackerRank system. Some of you may have used that in job applications and so forth. If you uh, go to that link uh, on your uh, laptop, uh, you should be able to uh, go into the HackerRank test. Uh, you will need to, to give your name and email address. Um, so that's something that HackerRank requires, so I can't stop that. But um, uh, we're not collecting that information uh, for, for any purpose other than to help you uh, with tonight's session. OK. Um, so uh, I'll just give you a minute to, uh, to log into that uh, address. So it will look like a, a programming test. Uh, don't worry about the, the test. It's not a, it's not a test. Uh, it's just so that you can see the source code that I'll be talking about. And you can actually uh, you know, make some changes to it, run it, play around with it, whatever you want to do. You can do that on the HackerRank system right on your laptop. Okay, has everyone, everyone got that now? Take that as a yes. Okay, now I'm going to be asking questions uh, while I go. Uh, we have some, some Optiva uh, swag here. I have some 4x4 four four, uh, Rubik's Cubes. Uh, we have a, a nice chess set, Optiva branded chess set. So um, when I ask questions, you know, if you happen to give me an answer that I particularly like, uh, then uh, I will uh, perhaps give you some of this swag. So, yes, it's bribery and corruption. I'm trying to get you to answer my questions, okay? Uh, so let's, uh, let's hopefully uh, do that. All right, okay. So, uh, so the first uh, probably um, half an hour or so of this session, we'll be looking at the, the code in question one of the test. So if you go into question one, that's what we'll be looking at uh, first. All right. So uh, let me actually bring up the code. OK, now can people read that at the back of the room? Yes? Good. OK. So um, C++ code, as you probably are vaguely aware, uh, is, uh, or the C++ language, is a derivative of the C programming language, uh, which was originally invented way back in the 1970s, around about when I was born. Uh, and um, uh, so the, the syntax is very reminiscent of, of languages of that era. Um, and so it's, the syntax is meant to be kind of compact and very expressive. Uh, and the uh, C language did not have any object-oriented features when it was invented. Those were added later, in the late 80s, uh, when uh, the C++ language was created as a, as a derivative of the C language. So what we're going to do first is we're going to start without object-oriented features. We're just going to look at variables, functions, expressions, that sort of thing. Okay. So every C++ program starts with a function called main, M-A-I-N, main. So you can see on your screens or on the big screen uh, the definition of the function main. And um, basically what we can see here is the way that you define a function is that you first give its return type. So the return type of the main function is int, short for integer. Then the name of the function, main in this case. Then the arguments of the function in brackets, as you might expect from other programming languages. Uh, and the uh, arguments of the function are defined in the same way. Type comes first, name comes second. Okay. Uh, and then the actual code of the function is surrounded in curly braces. Okay, everyone following me so far? Okay, getting a few nods. Good. Okay. 
So um, basically, what we're starting with here is if I can bring the uh, sorry, let me just bring the slides back up. There we go. All right, so what we're starting with here is, is how you define a function or uh, a variable. So um, one thing that's very important to note is that in C++, uh, C++ is a strongly typed programming language, um, like Java if you're familiar with Java, but unlike Python if you're familiar with Python. So what that means is that every variable, every function uh, has a type, and uh, the system will check to make sure that whatever uh, values you put in a variable uh, are compatible with the type defined for that variable. Uh, if they are not compatible, then the system will not compile your program. We'll, we'll learn what compiling is a little later, for those who don't know. Um, so it's a strongly typed language, everything has a type, and when you use a variable or a function, you have to use it with values of the correct type, or at least a compatible type. Okay, so that's the first thing to note. So uh, we've seen function definition, that begins with the type, then the function name and so on. Variable definition looks very much the same, type and then a name. Uh, and a variable can have an initializer. So if I uh, just bring back the code for a second. Uh, okay, this is going to get tedious if I keep switching like this. So, all right. So we can see some variable definitions here. So on line 8, we have uh, a variable definition for uh, a variable of type char named source. And then we have some weird stuff after that. On line 9, we have another variable char named output. And then on line 10, we have int and then output size, and it's initialized to 0. So uh, that's how you define variables. So what do those square brackets mean? Square brackets mean it's a variable of an array type, okay? So it's an array of char in the case of the source variable on line 8, uh, and again an array of char of, uh, on line 9, for the output variable. The variable on line 8 has an initializer, which is a string, okay? So uh, we initialize the variable source to this string of S's and B's, uh, and you'll note that uh, unlike the variable on line 9, there's no size in the square brackets. There's no number inside the square brackets. So what line 8 is saying is I want an array of characters called source, and I want to initialize it with the string, and I want the uh, system to work out how big it is. Okay, so the system's going to work out how big it is, so I don't have to. Make sense? Great. So on the line 9, I'm defining an array of char, but I'm not initializing it, so I have to say how big it is. Okay? So I've said 50, just as a, uh, a number that's big enough for, for my needs today. Okay? Uh, and then the output size integer is 0. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, now, uh, let's take a look at the arguments to the main function. Uh, so if we look on line 7, the main function has two arguments, argc and argv. You may have seen these in other programming languages, uh, uh, depending on which language you're coming from. Basically, these are the command line arguments. So if you invoke a C++ program from the command line, you can supply arguments. The argc variable is an integer. It's the number of arguments. It is at least one uh, because the the command line has to start with the name of the command, so there's always at least one argument. And then argv is an array of these funny things called char stars, char style. So a star at the end of a type converts that type into a pointer. Okay, now uh, pointers are uh, a relic of the past. <laughs> um, most modern languages try their very best to uh, hide pointers from you. Uh, so you may not have uh, encountered pointers before. But the basic idea with a pointer is that it's, it's actually a number, it's an integer, and it's the location in memory of your data. Okay? 
And so what that means is that you can use this variable, which is a pointer, to access some data which is in a different location in memory from uh, where we want or from where the, the pointer is. So actually what this is saying is char star argv square bracket square bracket means argv is an array. We don't know how big it is, because, but the, uh, the system will take care of that for us. And every element of the array is a pointer to a char. Okay? Now stop me if you're not following me. Okay? So uh, this may sound a bit strange. Why is every element of argv being pointed to a single char? The char being a character, right? Now the answer is it's not. The funny thing about arrays in C++ is that uh, an array is actually a pointer. Oh dear, we've lost the... Uh, are we getting it back? There we go. Okay. An array is actually a pointer. So I could actually have done uh, something like this. If I bring this over here, I'm just going to modify the code for a second. There we go, chart star. And I could use the variable source in exactly the same way as I could if it was an array. Okay? So a pointer in C++ and in C um, is, the, is a pointer to a, a thing of the specified type, but it could also be a pointer to an array of that type. Okay, so an array of char in this case. All right? The only difference between a pointer, a variable which is of a pointer type, and a variable which is of an array type, is that if it's of an array type, you cannot change the variable itself. You can only change the contents of the array. But if it's of a pointer type, you can actually change the variable itself. Okay? You can, uh, you can actually add to it or subtract from it or just change it to something completely different. Okay? All right. So we've seen how to um, define uh, variables. We've seen how to define functions. Uh, another interesting little thing that you'll see in the code, again, on your screens and uh, on the big screen, is if we have a look at line uh, four, you'll see there what looks like a function definition, except that there's no contents to the function, right? There's no code in the function. This is what's called a forward declaration. Um, it's a, a, a declaration of a function without supplying the body or the content of the function. So the, the body or the content of the function has to be somewhere else. And uh, if we scroll down, lo and behold, it's down the bottom. Okay? So why do you have forward declarations? Uh, because sometimes you have a situation where uh, one piece of code needs the definition of something, and that something needs the definition of the first piece of code. You have this circular uh, reference situation going on. And so by using forward declarations, you can say, hey, there is a function called compress. Trust me, it's somewhere. Okay? And uh, you can then supply the actual definition of that function later on. Okay? All right, now, the compress function uh, takes a const char array. Uh, so the const, uh, as you may guess, means that uh, you cannot modify the contents of the array. So we, we supply an array as the argument, but we can't modify it. Okay, we can only read it. Uh, it then takes an integer. Actually, if I go down to the, to the bottom one, uh, we'll see a little bit better. Okay, so we've got uh, a const as the first argument, an integer size as the second argument. Um, we need that second argument because we don't know how big the array is. Okay? Uh, so we need to know inside the compress function how big the array is. Uh, it, uh, different calls to compress might be given different sized arrays, so we need to know uh, what the size of the array is. Uh, we then give it a char star called out. That's where we're going to put the compressed version of our array. And uh, then we give it this funny thing, int ampersand. Now, does anyone know what an int ampersand is? Yes. 
Okay, and what does a reference mean? I actually don't know exactly because I'm more used to Rust, but uh, I'm guessing it's something like referencing and Rust, right? It doesn't look exactly like a C pointer, something more to it. Uh, yes, that's pretty close. So I will, uh, thank you, sir. Please have a, uh, a little All right, okay, so yeah, uh, what the gentleman said is basically correct. It's a reference to an integer. Now, what is the reference? It's, it sounds funny, right? Basically, what happens when we have a reference is that um, we're saying, uh, actually, this variable refers to that variable over there, some variable somewhere else. So whenever we use the variable out underscore size, we are actually manipulating some other variable somewhere else. Okay? So um, we can now actually have a look at the body of the main function. And if you've actually read the question uh, in the hackering system, you'll know what this piece of code is meant to do. This piece of code is meant to perform something called run linked encoding, which is a very, very simple uh, compression scheme uh, designed for uh, the kinds of data which has uh, long runs of identical values. Okay, uh, now <laughs> I grew up in the 80s. Data back then had long runs of identical data. It's very much rarer now for that to happen. So you don't see run length encoding happening very often these days. Um, but uh, back in the old days, it was uh, a reasonably popular method of compression uh, for images, for example. So what this piece of code is meant to do is to perform a run length encoding of this string that we've got in the source variable. Uh, and then it's going to print out the, uh, uh, the compressed version of the string. Okay? Uh, so we can see... Uh, what the code is doing on line 12 is it's calling the compress function and it gives the source array as the, the first array to the compress function. It, we now need the size of that array. Okay, we need to know how big it is. And we don't know how big it is, so we want the system to tell us how big it is. And fortunately, C++ has a function, built-in function, that does that for us called size of, uh, so we can call size of source, um, and for those who don't know, strings uh, have a null terminator at the end of them. Okay, they have a, a zero byte at the end of them. So the actual size of a string is one larger than uh, it appears to be. Uh, there's a, this invisible terminator at the end of the string. So that's why I say size of source minus one. I want this, the number of characters in my source string, right? Stop me if uh, you're not following me. Yes? Why do you not use the long use? Uh, because um, it, we can use size of in this case. Well, actually, funnily enough, we can't use size of in this case because I changed source to a char star and uh, uh, we can't, uh, the compiler can't work out the size of a char star. So I'll just turn that back into an array uh, and then uh, we can use size of. So what size of does is tell us the size at compile time, at the time when we define the program, not at runtime. Okay, so size of is evaluated when you define the program, not when you run the program. So uh, sterlin, which is uh, a function which uh, dynamically works out the length of a string, that operates at runtime. Uh, we don't need it to operate at runtime in this case because this, this string is fixed size. Okay. All right, so, uh, so we're calling compress with source, the size of the source, uh, and then we're giving it our output array, which is where it's going to put the compressed version, and we're giving it output size, and remember that last argument to compress is a reference. So when we give it output size, anytime they change that variable inside the compress function, it's actually going to change this output size variable defined on line 10. Making sense? Okay, all right, so uh, if we come down here now, we'll start to see some control flow. Um, so uh, like other languages, uh, C++ has loops and if statements and switch statements uh, that you will have seen elsewhere. Um, the syntax might be a little different depending on what language you're coming from. Uh, basically, here we have a for loop. Uh, so the for loop begins with the keyword for, obviously, and then in brackets, 
we define a counter variable, in this case an integer i, uh, initialized to zero, and then uh, we have a semicolon, then we have the loop continuation condition, where the loop will continue while this expression is true, so while i is less than output size, uh, and then uh, we increment i by 2 at the end of every iteration of the loop. Okay? Uh, and what we're doing here now is we're defining a variable count. Uh, so, so for those who don't know how run length encoding works, uh, let me uh, write it down on the board. So if we have a string like S, 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 B, 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 run length encoding, we'll compress this to 4, S, 3, Okay? Uh, that's the compressed version of uh, this, this string. So that's what compress is meant to do. Okay, so what this is going to do is it's going to get the count, and now it's doing something very interesting. It's getting a char. Uh, remember, output is an array of char, so it's taking a char, it's taking an element of that array, and it's converting it to an int, which is a strange thing to do. And uh, the reason why we can do that is because in C++, char is actually an integer type. It's, it's actually an integer. Okay? Uh, it's just uh, defined as char because it's a very convenient place to store a single character if you're using ASCII. <laughs> uh, okay? So uh, we can actually convert that to an integer. That gives us uh, the, the count, the 4 in this case, or the 3. Uh, and then, oh dear, wait for it, there we go, okay, oh, can we go, okay, yeah, and then, then uh, the next thing we get is the, the actual byte, so the, the S or the B, and uh, then we use this funny thing called studded C out, it's part of the standard library, I will tell you more about that later, but for now, just treat that as syntactic magic that prints stuff to the screen, <laughs> okay? Studded C out means we're going to print something to the screen. I'll explain more a little later in the uh, in the session. Okay, so basically what this code is doing is it's calling compress to do a row length encoding of our string in the source array, uh, and then this loop is basically going to print it out. And then this last line, line 21, is going to print a new line, and then we return zero. So what does returning zero mean? So uh, on Unix systems way back in the 70s, again, uh, if a program had an output uh, uh, status of zero, that meant everything's fine. <laughs> it worked. If it had a non-zero output status, then something had gone wrong. And uh, the value of the output status might help you to understand what went wrong. So by returning zero from main, we're saying uh, everything went fine we're, and we're done. Okay. All good so far. All right, so uh, I'll leave it as an exercise for, for you to actually implement the compress function. Um, maybe I'll uh, give you some hints a little later on, but uh, for now I want to move on because uh, time is, is getting away from us. I keep losing my mouse. Okay, now um, uh, we've talked about defining variables, so uh, C++ has uh, a number of uh, what are called simple types, we've seen most of them already, so you have char, which is an integer type, uh, you have bool, obviously boolean, uh, the uh, values that a boolean variable can take are true or false, then you have uh, other integer types, short, int, long, and long, long. Uh, and then you have your uh, real number types, float, double, and long, double. And uh, then you have void, which signifies the absence of type. Okay, so if you have a function which doesn't actually return a value, it just does some uh, work, then that function could return void, which just means it doesn't actually return anything. Okay? All right, now why do we have all these integer types? So we've got char, short, int, long, long, long. Why do we have all these integer types? Anyone? Yeah? Mm -hmm. 
Yes. Uh, so again, remember that C++ is derived from C back when computers were uh, uh, a lot uh, less powerful than they are today. The first computer I ever had had 16 kilobytes of memory. That's kilobytes. <laughs> okay. Uh, so um, you you actually cared a great deal about how big your your variables were because you had a very limited amount of memory. Uh, not so important uh, today unless you care about performance. If you really care how fast your code goes, then you might actually care exactly how big uh, the variable is. Um, okay. Uh, um, you can uh, change a uh, uh, integer variable. Sorry, yes, you have a question? Uh, yes, okay. Uh, we're about to get into that, but basically the difference is that the range of values that a float can store is smaller than the range of values that a double can store. Okay? Uh, so, um, or uh, it's smaller, but it's also uh, less accurate. A float is less accurate than a double. Uh, so, sorry? So, float is typically 32. Uh, and double is typically 64. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, so um, integer types like char, short, int, long, and long, long uh, can uh, be either signed, which is the default, so they can uh, signed integer can have a negative or a positive value, uh, or it can be unsigned. Uh, and the way that you make it unsigned is that you prefix it with the word unsigned. Right. So you say unsigned long if you want an unsigned long, okay, a long that can only have positive values. The advantage, of course, of having an unsigned long is that it can uh, hold a larger range of positive values uh, than uh, a signed long. Um, if you just say signed, uh, or if you want a signed int, right, or an unsigned int, you can just say signed and then stop, okay? So signed by itself is a signed int, Unsigned by itself is an unsigned int. Uh, so that was uh, because programmers are lazy and because they, they didn't want to have to type signed int, so they just type signed. Okay. Uh, okay, you, you can have const before your variable, which I've said before, uh, star making it a pointer and an epsilon uh, making it a, um, a reference. Okay, uh, now uh, integer types. Let's talk a little bit more about those. Um, how big is uh, a integer. Does anyone know how big an integer is in, in C++? Four, four bytes? Anyone want to uh, challenge that? Someone up the back there? Aha! Uh -huh. It depends on the platform. Do you want to say a bit more about that? Uh, yep, yes, you can. Uh, there are uh, types in C++ which uh, actually specify exactly how big they are, or at least how big they, the minimum size they have to be, yep. Yes. Yeah, so the idea is, uh, and, uh, sorry, I forgot to give you a Let me run back here, and uh, we'll Thank you. All right, so, um, Basically, the way the C++ uh, language is specified, uh, a char is at least 8 bits, which means it can store negative 128 to positive 127. Okay? Uh, a short is at least 16 bits. An int is also at least 16 bits. Uh, a long is at least 32, and a long long is at least 64. Now, um, the the C++ standard here is a bit loose, okay? Uh, you can achieve, uh, you, can, you can conform with the standard if all of your types are 64 bits long, <laughs> right? If your char is 64 bits, you're into 64 bits, that, that's fine. It works, okay? So all that the standard uh, requires is that the variables have at least that size, okay? Uh, now, as the gentleman up the back pointed out, in uh, uh, modern C++, you can actually uh, get some types that look like this, like int32t, 
is a 32-bit integer, okay? And it's, it's actually 32 bits, okay? It's not minimum 32 bits. Uh, and you can do uint for unsigned int of 32 bits. The problem is that uh, the standard says um, that the, the C++ implementer, the implementer of the language, does not need to provide this type. <laughs> okay, they, they can actually not provide this type. Uh, so if you use this type in, in code, it may be uh, not uh, uh, transferable to another platform. It's very unlikely that we'll find a platform that doesn't support this, but according to the standard, uh, it, it is uh, potentially the case. So uh, there are actually other type names which allow you to say, I want the, the smallest integer that is at least 32 bits long, or at least 16 bits long. You can, uh, that type is guaranteed to exist in C++. And there's one where you can say, I want the fastest integer type for this platform that is at least 32 bits or 16 bits, whatever, whatever you want. Uh, but if you're trying to write portable C++ code, uh, you can use the, these types. Uh, just remember, they have, the, the, the way the standard works is they are of a certain minimum size. Okay, you're not guaranteed uh, anything other than that they're at least as big as what the standard says. Yes? Where does I was clicking fail or can you give an example? Where does this fail? Yeah, where does it fail? So the, uh, basically what the standard says is that um, the implementer of the C++ compiler does not need to supply this type. So if you, what would happen is if they hadn't supplied this type, you would uh, try to compile your program and the compiler would fail. It would say, no, I can't compile this. Okay? Um, now, it's uh, very unlikely that anyone would produce a compiler which doesn't supply this. Um, almost all uh, computer architectures these days supply uh, an integer which is 32 bits long. Okay? So it would have to be specialized hardware would be an example of where it might not work. Why are there so many C++ compilers? Why, why are there so many C++ compilers? <laughs> Great question. Um, uh, back in, back in 1980, remember C++ was invented in the 80s, okay? Uh, and back then, you could make money by putting out a good compiler uh, as a software product. You, you could sell that product. Now these days, uh, you can download uh, the GNU C++ compiler for free. Um, the major uh, software vendors, Microsoft and Apple, will just give you their, their C++ compiler. You can just download it for free. You might have to pay for, say, Visual Studio, the IDE, uh, but you can actually download uh, compilers for, for free, right? Uh, but back then, you could make money. So people started writing compilers and trying to make money. Uh, and also, um, uh, so when the GNU C++ compiler was written, part of the, the idea was to produce a, a free one, right? Uh, because uh, Richard Stallman, the, uh, the GNU guy, uh, wanted software to be free. Um, and then uh, you had other vendors who, who wanted to produce C++ compilers for, for slightly different reasons. So you had this proliferation, okay? All right. Uh, okay, so let's keep moving. Uh, all right, now there are also aggregate types. So we've already seen uh, one, which is the array. Uh, an array is just a, a sequence of values of a certain type. Uh, and then there's also structs. I don't have an example of struct in, uh, in the code in front of you, so I'll just do one on the board very quickly. So we can say struct, uh, and we'll give our struct a name. Let's call it S. It's a very imaginative. And then you do a curly brace, and then you have some, some data members. So maybe we've got an integer. A uh, and a, uh, a float uh, B, uh, and we might even have uh, an array. We might even have char C square bracket 10, right? And then we close it with a curly brace. Okay? So um, this is an, an aggregate type uh, basically defining a, a block of memory which contains an integer, a float, and a char. The block of memory for a struct will be at least as big as is required to store these three variables, possibly bigger. Okay, because uh, it's possibly bigger because the uh, system needs to make sure that certain variables are aligned on, on certain byte boundaries, so they have to be on a 32-bit boundary or something like that. Uh, and so it might add padding in between variables or at the end of the struct. Uh, 
but you can, if you want to know what the uh, size of it is, of course, you can use size of, right? And that'll tell you how big it is. Okay. Uh, so, so that's the uh, aggregate type. Okay. Now, um, uh, as a C plot. Sorry. Yes. Question. Is? Uh -huh. Great question. So I'm going to get onto that in a, in a little while. Uh, but the short answer is um, that uh, struct and class are almost interchangeable. Um, class was added, so struct was something that was in C before C++ came along. Class was added when C++ came along. So a class is almost interchangeable with a struct. Uh, the difference is the default uh, uh, access level. <laughs> So I'll get into that uh, in a minute, okay? Um, just bear with me. All right, so as C++ got bigger and bigger, of course, uh, it's, uh, as you know, with any, any code base, um, you have name collisions, right? You, you try to define a function called, uh, I don't know, find, and uh, unfortunately someone else has defined a function called find, right? Uh, so uh, one of the things they did about this was they allowed you to uh, define a namespace. So let me actually do this, just demonstrate this for you. Uh, okay, so what I can do here uh, is I can say namespace. I can barely read this, so hopefully you can. Uh, I'll call it Greg because that's my name. All right, and then uh, we'll put this down here. Okay, so I've put the compress. Uh, function inside a namespace, okay? Uh, and uh, now what I need to do if I want to call this compress function is I have to tell the system where to find it. So uh, there we go. So I just prefix that with the namespace and then the double colon. Uh, people can read that, right? Yep. Uh, so uh, what that does is basically it creates this namespace and then uh, we can avoid name collisions uh, by putting things in a namespace, okay? This will become important a little later on, but you just need to know for now you can have a namespace. Um, another interesting thing to be aware of is when do variables start and stop existing? Okay, the scope of variables. So uh, we can see the variables defined, it's now on lines 11, 12, and 13 on my screen here, uh, the source, output, and output size variables, they're defined at the beginning of the main function. They, obviously, they begin to exist uh, once we enter the main function and start executing that code. And they cease existing when we exit the main function, right? What about the variables count and byte defined on lines 18 and 19? Well, they begin to exist when uh, we enter the, the block of code uh, that they uh, are contained within, so the, the block beginning on uh, line 17, um, or actually 18, uh, depending how you count it, um, and they cease existing uh, once we leave that block. Okay? So uh, it's important uh, that we know that variables have this limited lifespan uh, because when variables go away, uh, actually becomes very important to us later on. Okay, so just be aware of that. Um, okay, and then another thing is um, to be aware that uh, by default, function arguments are passed by value, uh, not passed by reference, unless you actually define the, um, uh, the type of the argument to the function as a reference type, in which case now it becomes passed by reference. Uh, but if you don't do that, it's passed by value, right? So... Uh, what about this, when we call compress with our source array uh, here on this line here, uh, we call compress with source. I just said, okay, it's passed by value, right? So does that mean that the compress function gets a copy of my source string or not? Anyone? Up the back there? Yes, that's right. Remember, arrays are pointers, okay? An array and pointer are almost interchangeable. So when you call a function with a, a variable of an array type as the argument, uh, it's actually just copying the pointer. It's not copying the whole array, 
Okay. Now later on, we'll see some data types uh, where uh, it actually copies the whole thing. Okay. So if you had a string that was, you know, 10 megabytes long, it would copy the 10 megabyte string, right? Uh, and that's probably bad, especially if you care about the performance of your code, right? So um, it's important to remember that in C++, arguments are passed by value unless you do something uh, to change that, right? So uh, the most common way is to make the argument uh, uh, a reference type, uh, and then the compiler will essentially take care of it for you. It'll pass by reference instead of by value. Or uh, you could pass a pointer to the thing instead of the thing itself, okay? Like uh, what happened with an array. All right. Oops. Yeah. Okay, let's see. Um, all right, we've already looked at statements, uh, but I'll just quickly uh, say a couple of words. Uh, okay, so uh, we've seen the if statement. Uh, actually, no, we haven't seen the if statement already. Uh, so there's an if statement, it's very much like the if statements you've seen in other languages, so I won't go into any detail there except to say that the, the Boolean expression uh, that follows the if must be enclosed in brackets, uh, which is a bit different from some other languages, but in C++ it must be enclosed in, enclosed in brackets. Uh, the switch statement, very much like switch in other languages, so switch followed by an expression which gives you a value, and then you have a number of case values, uh, basically labels, and then code in between them. Then I won't go into too much detail there. You have while loops, while condition do a statement, just like other languages. Again, like if statements, the condition must be in brackets. Okay. Uh, you have for loops like a, uh, uh, like we've already seen. You have do while loops. So uh, let me give an example of this. This is not present in some other languages. Ah, sorry, coming while there. So we can say do, and then we can go open a curly brace, and then we can do some stuff. No, no, instead of see out. Something. Okay, and then we close the curly brace, and then we say while, and then we give it a condition. Okay, uh, and basically this is very much like a while loop, except that the, the body is executed at least once. Okay, whereas in a while loop, the body, of course, uh, as you hopefully know, may not be executed at all in a while loop if the condition is false at the start of the loop. In a do while loop. The body is executed at least once, and then the condition is evaluated to see whether it continues iterating around the loop. The last kind of uh, loop is the range for loop. Uh, so what this one looks like is basically this. You say for, uh, then you give it a, a type, where you say int, uh, and then you uh, have to give the uh, a name, colon, and then you give it some kind of collection type. It could be a, an array or one of the collection types we'll see later. So collection, and then curly brace, some statements, and some curly brace. And basically what this will do is it will basically I will take on each value in the collection uh, without you having to you know, manually uh, deal with the interaction with the collection. Okay? We'll see exactly how this works a little later. Okay, so that's the uh, 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 range for iteration statement. Okay, now here's where the real fun begins. In C++, you have the power to manage memory yourself. Uh, okay, uh, so um, the, the old joke was that uh, uh, if uh, Python uh, won't let you shoot yourself in the foot, and some other languages will allow you to sort of harm yourself a little. Languages like C and C++ allow you to blow your whole foot right off. Okay, because they allow you to manage memory yourself, and it's very, very easy to screw that up. Uh, so the way that you do that is with the new and delete statements. Um, so uh, actually, we can see these in action. So what we can do right now 
is we can actually go to the question, uh, the, the, sorry, the code for question number two. Let's see if I can get there from here. Uh, Oh, I can't read this. So we're getting ahead of, ahead of ourselves here, but we can see an example. Okay, so here, uh, oh dear, we can't read that. Um, okay, so here on line 22 of the code, you can see we've used new, the new operator, to allocate some memory. In this case, we've allocated uh, enough memory to hold an array of char with a length of 65,536. Okay? So what that does is it allocates some memory, uh, and uh, it works out how big that memory needs to be based on the type that we give it. And uh, and then we can use that memory, uh, how we want. We'll see how we use that in a minute. And at some point, we have to free up that memory. We have to deallocate the memory. We have to tell the system we don't need it anymore. Okay? And the way that you do that is with the delete statement that you can see on line 26. Now, uh, if you allocate in a way, so if we say uh, allocate new child square bracket something, square bracket, that's, that's in a way, then you have to use delete with square brackets after it to free that array. If what you allocate is not an array, you just say new and then say char with the, without the square brackets, then you just say delete without the square brackets. Okay? So if you if you new with square brackets, you must delete with square brackets. If you new without square brackets, then you must delete without square brackets. Okay? Alright, so uh, what this allows us to do is, is allocate memory whenever we need it and deallocate it whenever we're done with it. And of course, uh, the way to go wrong is that you uh, allocate the memory and then for whatever reason, you forget to deallocate it and you've got a memory leak uh, and everything starts to slow down and grind to a halt. Okay? So, uh, we're going to see how to avoid that a little later on. How are we going for time? Okay. Uh, I think we're nearly done over here. Uh, so, yeah, let's, uh, what I'm going to talk about next is user-defined types. Uh, but before we do that, let's take a quick break, uh, and uh, we'll come back in uh, what, five or ten minutes. Uh, okay, so we'll take a break. Uh, so what I want to talk about uh, now is how you define your own types. Uh, we've seen how to define a, a struct already, but... Um, uh, we're going to define classes now, which get a bit more advanced. Uh, hopefully you've seen classes from other languages. Um, so, um, the term encapsulation is used to, to mean that you're bundling together data with the mechanisms that manipulate or operate on that data. Okay, and that's, that's exactly what a class is uh, that you'll hopefully have seen from a, some other object-oriented programming language that you may have used. Um, it can also refer, the, the word encapsulation can also refer to uh, the, the idea of being able to hide the data within a class. So uh, some data within a class, you want your users to be able to access that data or, the, or those uh, methods of the class, uh, but other things you don't want them to be able to access. You want to hide those away so that they can't access them. Uh, and encapsulation refers to that as well. So in C++, um, a, a struct, like we've seen a few minutes ago, a struct uh, can actually do this encapsulation. It can actually have both data members, so variables of, of certain types, just like I showed you before, but it can also have function members, uh, which are called methods, uh, and those function uh, me uh, members uh, operate on the data in the struct. Okay, So you can define a struct that's got both data and uh, methods, data and functions, data and methods. Now, um, the way that you control uh, access to the members of the struct is you use these uh, uh, keywords public, private, 
and protect it. Okay? Uh, so if uh, we do something like this, if we say struct, uh, we give it a name, x, whatever we want, in the curly brace, then we can say, all right, uh, let's say uh, we want some stuff that's private, and we say private colon, and then we define some members, like int a, or maybe we give it a, 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 a method, void, do stuff, uh, and these things are private. Private means only methods within the, the struct can access the, uh, the things that are private. So the only thing that can access A is a method of this struct X class. The only thing that can call do stuff is a method of class, uh, sorry, struct X. Okay, does that make sense? So, of course, you can have public, which means anyone can access it. There's no restriction on access. And the other one is protected, which means only sub-structs, uh, uh, derived structs, which, and we'll see how to do that in a minute, can access it if it's protected. So public means anyone, private means no one except the methods of the struct, and protected means derived uh, structs, okay? Uh, all right, now a class uh, is just like a struct, except of course the word class uh, has been substituted for the word struct. So what I can do is, uh, is I can just do this, class, okay? And now we have something that looks very much like a struct, except that it's called a class. And to, to your question from earlier, what's the difference between a struct and a class? The answer is that by default, uh, if you don't give one of these access specifiers, by default, um, the things in a class are private. Um, but in a struct, they're public. Okay, that's the difference. Uh, so um, basically, if we just omit this, uh, in a class, A and do stuff are private, but if we did struct instead, now A and do stuff are public. Okay? All right. So um, uh, I'm just going to use the word class. But when I talk about a class, it could have been defined as a struct or a, or a class. Okay? Uh, we'll just talk about classes. All right. Um, uh, so you can have methods on your uh, class. Uh, just like other object-oriented programming languages, um, the methods can access the data and uh, other method members of that class or of, of any uh, base or superclass. Um, uh, did I talk about function overloading earlier? I meant to, but I may have missed it. I forgot about function overloading. Oh, silly me. Okay. So, one thing you can do when you're defining a function, uh, let's define a function, we'll call it f because I'm very imaginative, and it takes an integer argument x and then does some stuff. Okay? Well, in many languages, if we tried to define another function called f, the, the system would complain, right? It would say, no, you've already got a function called f, you can't have another one. Not in C++. In C++, we can do something like this. We can say int f, and then we can say, all right, um, this one takes a double. Uh, okay, we'll call it double d, uh, and do some stuff. So now the function f, uh, it's overloaded. It actually has multiple definitions. The compiler, when the function f is called, the compiler will try to figure out which one is the right one. Okay? Uh, and uh, sometimes you have to help it. <laughs> okay? Um, if, if it can't figure out, like if I call f with 0.0, 0, 0, well, this is a floating point thing, so it probably means this one, right? Um, but if I just call f0, well, it could be either of these, right? Uh, so it doesn't know which one, okay? Uh, so you might have to help the compiler out, but uh, as long as the argument lists are different, then you can overload a function. And of course, a method inside a struct or a class is, is pretty much like a function, which means you can override the methods of a, uh, of a class. Um, also, inside uh, a class, a method inside a class, 
uh, uh, has access to a, a hidden variable, a variable you might not even realize is there. It's called this. Okay? Uh, so why would you need that? Let me give you an example. Okay, so now uh, let's suppose we have uh, some class, class, oops, class C, uh, and then we've got a method, uh, we'll call the method M, and it takes an argument which is a integer called X, okay? And also in our class, we're going to have a data member, which is an integer called x. Okay? So now inside my method, if I say x equals 3, which x am I referring to? Uh, and the answer is uh, that you're referring to the one in the innermost scope, which basically means you bring this one. Okay? What if you wanted to refer to this one? Well, what you could do is you could say this arrow x uh, and now that's referring to this x, not this x. Okay? Make sense? Yep. Okay. Uh, and that, by the way, illustrates something interesting about structs and classes, is that if you have a, a pointer to a struct or a class, right, uh, then you can use this special arrow operator. But if you've got a variable of the struct or class type, you would use a dot operator. So if I say, if I define a variable of type C, we'll call it C, uh, you know, uh, well, C, okay, then I can uh, access the method just by saying C dot M, over bracket 3, right, something like that. So I use the dot. If I define a pointer to C, uh, we'll call it P, equals something, uh, then what I would have to do is I would have to dereference the pointer. And the way you dereference a pointer is you say star p, that dereferences the pointer, and then you would go dot and then m, and now you get into a problem, which is that operators have uh, an order of precedence in the way that they bind, right? Uh, so which binds uh, strongest? Does the star bind strongest or does the dot bind strongest? And the answer is the dot find strongest. So this is equivalent to putting brackets like that, okay, which is not what we want. <laughs> so what we would do, what we would have to do is we would have to say bracket star p to dereference the pointer and then point bracket and then dot m. Uh, and not only is that sort of ugly, it's also tedious and we're developers, we don't like hard work, so we have the uh, arrow operator which does that for us, okay? So that's what the arrow operator does, okay? So this is a hidden variable inside the methods of a class that allows us to uh, access the members uh, when their names might be shown up by something else, okay? And, uh, now I'm going through this very, very fast, so are people okay? Is, it, is this good? Anyone want to stop and ask me a question? Good? Okay. All right. So, uh, so we can define a class, we can define uh, functions or, or methods inside the class. Um, and so the next thing we want to worry about uh, is um, uh, constructors and destructors. So um, you hopefully are familiar from other programming languages with constructors. That is uh, the way you initialize a variable of class type is uh, the constructor is called and it sets up uh, the uh, instance of the class uh, and you can of course do that in um, C++ uh, and we'll see an example of that in just a second on our screens. C++ classes also have this weird thing called a destructor. It's, uh, it's called when the variable goes away. So if the constructor is called when the variable is created, the destructor is called when the variable uh, is destroyed, okay? Um, so why would you need one of those? I'll show you why uh, in a moment. But, uh, a couple of other things I wanted to say just quickly is that um, uh, the constructor is a method, so like other methods, it can be overloaded, okay? So you can have 
multiple constructors for your class. Okay, and, and the difference is just in the arguments that they take. Uh, so maybe we define a, a class C and we define a constructor C uh, over a bracket like that. And then we define another one which takes an integer as its argument uh, and then it does some stuff. Okay? So uh, we've got two different constructors, one which takes no arguments, one which takes one argument. Uh, and the person who's creating an in, uh, instance of this class, they can use whichever constructor that they, they like, as long as it's not private, right? <laughs> if, it, if you mark that constructor as private, then the only thing that can use it is code internal to the class. So what if, what if I wanted to call this second constructor from this first constructor, okay? How would I do that? And the answer is, I put a colon, and then I put the name of the class, and then any arguments. <laughs> okay? Uh, and then I put the body of my uh, constructor, right? So this is how, uh, this is called a delegating constructor. Uh, so this constructor is actually delegating to this one, uh, and it's supplying the argument which wasn't supplied uh, by whoever the call is. Okay? All right. Uh, da, da, da. Okay, so let's take a look at some actual code again. Uh, all right, so this is the code from question two. Um, now, the basic idea of question two is the same as question one. We, we want to implement a, uh, a run length decoder this time. Uh, so in question one, it's a run length encoder, and question two is a decoder. Um, uh, but we're doing it in an object-oriented way, okay? So we're doing it using classes. Excuse me. All right, so what I've defined is, firstly, I've defined a compressor class. I've actually used struct in this case uh, because the compressor class is uh, an abstract class. You can't instantiate it. Uh, you have to uh, create a subclass or a derived class, uh, which you can instantiate. Uh, so essentially, this is like an interface uh, from some other object oriented programming languages. All right? Um, now, my compressor class has a destructor, which is this tilde compressor method. Uh, and you'll see that I've marked it virtual. What virtual means is that you're allowed to override it. Okay? Uh, so, a virtual method is, can be overridden by a derived class. Okay? If you don't declare a method virtual and a derived class defines a method of the same name, then the, the method of the derived class essentially shadows or hides the one from the, the base class. Okay? Uh, but if, the, um, if you declare it virtual, uh, then you can override it. I've also said at the end here, I've said equals default. Again, this is because we're kind of lazy, right? Um, the empty destructor is the default one. Uh, so if I say equals default, the compiler is just going to uh, provide for me an empty constructor. Uh, basically, it's a little bit clearer than putting open curly brace close curly brace. Okay? By saying equals default, it's just a little bit clearer what's going on. Okay, um, so why do I have a destructor in my compressor? Sorry. Why do I have a constructor in my compressor class uh, when it does nothing? And the answer is because um, the uh, derived class might have a destructor which does something, uh, and I need to make sure it gets called. So remember from your object-oriented programming training that if you have some derived class D, which inherits from some superclass C, then I can declare a variable of type, uh, let's say, C, but I can put in it a value of type D. Sorry, this pen is terrible. Uh, can people read that? D, okay. Variable type C, uh, the value of type D. Uh, so if I try to now destroy this, should it use the destructor from the derived class or should it use the destructor from the base class? And the answer is it should use the one from the, base, from the derived class, sorry. Uh, so we need to mark the destructor virtual so that it knows that the destructor may be overridden and it should use the one from the derived class 
not the base class. Okay. Uh, all right. Now, uh, next up, we've got some methods, encode and decode. I've marked them virtual because uh, I'm saying that they can be overridden by a derived class. And I've then put equals zero at the end of them. That equals zero, what that means is that the compressor class cannot be instantiated. Right? Uh, no, no class that doesn't actually define encode and decode methods can actually be instantiated. So what we're saying is the compressor class is an abstract class. You shouldn't be able to instantiate the compressor class. What you need to do is create a derived class from compressor and that derived class must supply an encode and decode method. Follow me? Yes? Good. Okay. Uh, and then I've got a little convenience thing at the bottom there. Uh, print encoded, which is going to print out the encoded version of the um, uh, of the compressed data. Uh, now, interestingly, uh, at the end of my print encoded, I've got this const. Um, what that means is that the print encoded method does not modify um, the class, the, the state of the class, when it is called. So if you call print encoded, the state of the variable, uh, the state of the, the instance of the compressor class does not change inside the print encoded method. That's what the const means. Why would you bother to do that? Because the compiler can make the code faster if it knows that the print uh, encoded method doesn't change the instance. Okay? Right. Uh, okay, so let's actually see what uh, an implementation of this class would look like. So here we have our, our RLE compressor class and uh, we can see on uh, line 19 there that uh, it's got this colon after the name of the class and then public compressor. What that means is that RLE compressor is a derived class, it's a derivative of the compressor class. So why did we have to mark it public? Uh, and it's all about these access uh, specifiers uh, that we talked about earlier. If you inherit something publicly, then all of the public and protected things in the base class uh, remain public and protected in the derived class. If you inherit something privately, then all of the public and protected methods in the base become private in the derived class. Okay? And you can inherit protected and basically the public stuff becomes protected in the derived class, okay? So you're essentially, you're telling the uh, system that the derived class might have different uh, access specifiers for the base class than the base class itself does, okay? All right, next up we've got our constructor. It allocates some memory, uh, which we saw earlier. It creates this array of char of length 65,536. So of course, we have to make sure that we delete that memory somewhere, we have to free it up somewhere, and the place that we do that is the destructor. Okay, so we've got a constructor which allocates the memory, the destructor which uh, deallocates that memory, and so now if we create a, uh, an instance of this class, uh, it will clean up after itself when it, when it goes away. Okay? Right? So that's essentially what destructors are for. Okay, now if you hadn't actually finished answering question one in the uh, hacker inc, here's the answer. Um, so, you can just read the answer. Uh, so, uh, this, is, this actually does the uh, run length encoding. Uh, I won't go into too much detail about that except to say uh, uh, it's actually uh, implementing the encoding. Uh, okay, where is my notes? Okay. Uh, I've left the decode method for you to implement yourselves. Uh, I hope that's fun for you. And then the, the print encoded, it's just the code we saw earlier that printed out. And then down here, we have some private stuff. We have a, a pointer uh, to char workspace. That's the variable, remember, in the constructor. We, we put the uh, pointer to the memory we allocated in this variable called workspace. Uh, here, uh, down here is where we define the variable workspace. Okay? Uh, and we can also have private methods. So here's this copy workspace thing. Uh, is just used internally 
in my RLE compressor class, so I've made it private because the, the people outside the class don't need to use it. It's just used internally, okay? Right, so there we go. That's my class, and then we have our main method, which basically creates a new compressor. Uh, it puts, it, so it allocates the compressor using new. Uh, it, that does a memory allocation. And it puts the RLE compressor in a variable of type compressor. Okay, so the only thing we can do with our compressor variable is call the methods on the compressor class. We, we don't know that it's actually an RLE compressor, okay? And of course, we have to make sure oops, that we remember to delete it before we uh, finish up, okay? All right, so we've seen now how to uh, define uh, a user-defined type of class. Uh, and we've seen how to do inheritance, right? Great, okay. Uh, all right, let's bring back up the uh, slides. Uh, okay, we already talked about that. Uh, oh, uh, one thing I didn't mention is that you can... Um, uh, inst uh, oh, let me actually I'll bring up the code because that will make it clearer. Uh, okay. Uh, you'll see here, when I define the encode method uh, on line 29, I've said void encode in the arguments, then I've said override. I've used this keyword override. That means uh, I'm overriding the method from the base class. Okay? You can replace that override with the word final, F-I-N-A-L, final. And what that means is I'm overriding the method in the base class and any derived classes are not allowed to override me. Okay? So final means I'm not allowed to be overridden. So, and you can actually declare a class to be final. Uh, so you, can, you could say uh, that the, the RLE compressor class is final uh, by adding the word final, and then the whole class could not be overridden. Okay? It could not be uh, inherited from or derived. Okay. All right. All right. Now, the RLE compressor class, right, it's designed to work on uh, arrays of char. Okay? So you've got an, an array of char uh, that maybe has a streak of repeated values and it uses its run length encoding to compress the data. Okay? Now, the thing is, we said earlier, chars are just integers, right? They're just integers, but they happen to have a, um, a, a small range. Okay? They're, they're only guaranteed to be 8 bits wide. They might be bigger, uh, but they're only guaranteed to be 8 bits wide. The RLE uh, encoder could work on larger ends, right? Just as long as you've got streaks of the same value, then the RLE could work, right? Uh, it's less likely to work, okay? I get it. But it could work. Right? On, on any integer type, the RLE compressor could work. Does that make sense? Right, so here's the problem. I'll bring up my code again. Uh, okay, so here's uh, our RLE compressor. And uh, it takes, its encode method takes an argument of type char. Okay? So if we wanted to implement our RLE, RLE compressor for shorts, or ints, or longs, or long longs, right? Then we would have to actually define the whole class again, right? Which kind of sucks. Sounds like hard work. Remember, we're developers, we, we don't like hard work. How can we get the system to do it for us? And the answer is templates. So what we can do, and I'll just do this here in the code, is we can make our compressor class a template and now the compressor class basically it's not defined what what type it operates on so what I need to do is I need to go here and I need to say instead of char I need to say t t and over here t okay oops all right so now my compressor class uh, is a template uh, there's an argument to the template, which is a, the name of the type, and we've used the variable t 
to represent that name. Uh, and now the encode, decode, and freely encoded methods all take in an argument of type T, whatever T happens to be, uh, instead of an argument of type char. Now, of course, I need to do the same thing on my ROE compressor. Uh, uh, oh, no, right, okay. Uh, okay, now, uh, I can't just inherit from compressor because I need to say, I tell the compressor which type of compressor I need. So what I do is I just say that. Okay, so now I've, I'm saying my ROE compressor is a templated type, uh, a templated class that inherits from the templated compressor class. Uh, and of course, we replace any uh, chars here with T. Okay, and then we can basically define a class which uh, will work for any compatible type. Okay, I can, I can now use the ROE compressor with any compatible type, not just char. Okay, and the way it actually works is that whenever you use an instance of a class, which is a template class, if there is not already a definition of that class for the type you're using it with, then the compiler will write one. The compiler will write the class for you based on the template. Okay, uh, so you don't have to write it yourself. The compiler writes it for you, and uh, you've now got a, a templated uh, class that uh, will work for any any compatible type. Uh, is that okay? Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. All right. All right, now at this point I need to say a few words about compiling and linking. All right, so um, C++ applications, like other programming languages, might be very large and the code might be spread over multiple files, okay? Um, so uh, basically that, that's fine. You can define the code in multiple, multiple files. Uh, and what will happen <coughs> is that when you tell the system uh, that you're, you want to compile the code, you're, you're ready to uh, start using the code, what it's going to do is it's going to translate each file into what's called object code, the code that the CPU can actually execute, okay? The CPU can actually read that directly from RAM and execute it. So it converts each file into this object code, and then before you can actually run it, it has to link all the files together. It has to combine them all together, right? So let's take a look at an example. Sorry about this. Okay. All right. So here I've got my a file just called main.cc or main.cpp, sorry. Okay, and all it's got in this file is the main method, or the main function, I should say, sorry, main function. Uh, it's creating an RLE compressor on line nine, and notice I've put it in a namespace just to be fancy. Okay, it's creating that compressor, but that compressor isn't defined in this file, so it must be defined in some other file, right? So when the uh, system puts all the files together, it needs to know how to link references from one file to another, okay? Uh, and the system needs to know, you know, what, what things are there in other files? What's out there that I can use? And the way that we define what's out there to use is uh, we use something called a header file. So this is... Very tedious. Okay, so here's our header file. Uh, so this, uh, 
as you might recognize, contains our compressor class, which is abstract. And it contains the RLE compressor class, but it actually doesn't contain the code for any of the methods in the RLE compressor class. So that, that code must be somewhere else. Right? So this header file is something that I can include in other files so that those other files know what's in my compressor uh, uh, class. Okay? That they can know that my compressor class exists and what's inside it. Okay? So these headers allow us to uh, have a, a lightweight file that uh, can be imported or included in other files um, and then those files can use the code uh, from uh, my library or, or my uh, piece of code uh, without actually having to have that code right there inside the, um, the file. Okay, so those are header files. Now, uh, one of the interesting things about header files is that uh, you can end up in, uh, including or importing the same header file multiple times, okay, uh, and you don't want to do that. Uh, so compilers have a couple of different mechanisms for preventing that. This is one of them. Pragma once. This basically tells the system, only include this once. So if you've seen this file before, don't include it again. You've already seen it. Okay, you don't need to read it again. That's what it's saying. Okay? So where's the actual code for this thing? Uh, here we go. There's got to be a better way of doing this. So here is my compressor.cpp file. There we go. Okay, so here is where the actual code is. Right? So this is now a, not, a, not a header file, not a .h file, it's a cpp file. Note that it includes the header file. So it's got the same definitions that every other file sees. Uh, but now we have the, um, uh, the actual code for each of the methods. So uh, you can see the constructor, uh, I've defined the code by giving the name of the class, double colon, the name of the constructor, and then the body of the code. Same with the destructor, name of the class, double colon, name of the method, the destructor in this case, and then the body. Same with the encode method, right? Return type, name of the class, double colon, name of the method, then the body, okay? So this is how you can separate code across multiple files. This is not something you can do in the HackerRank system, uh, unfortunately, but if you're writing C++ code for a regular compiler, you separate code over multiple files uh, and uh, combine them together, uh, and that makes life a lot easier for you. All right. So what that uh, allows us to get to now is the what's called the standard template library. Okay? Uh, so this is the last topic I'll talk about, so we're nearly at the end. So the standard template library is, is a, a library of code that comes with uh, every good C++ compiler. Uh, so it's a standard library, uh, as the name implies. And it makes very, very heavy use of templates, which is why it's called the standard template library. And the reason why it makes very heavy use of templates is so that you can use all of the code that the standard template library provides with your own user-defined types, okay? So basically, um, uh, uh, it contains a whole bunch of stuff, I should say. The, um, uh, all of the stuff inside the standard template library lives in a namespace called STD, standard, right, STD. So everything's in a namespace called STD. All right, so um, probably the most important thing that's in the standard template library are a bunch of container classes, okay? Uh, these are classes of various kinds that allow us to store a collection of values, right? So, for example, there's the vector class, which is a dynamically sized array. It's an array which will grow bigger if you need it to, as opposed to the arrays we've seen before, which are fixed size. They, they can't grow, okay? Uh, there's list, which is a doubly linked list. There's set, which is an ordered collection of unique values. 
So you can uh, test for membership in the set. You can see if a value is in the set. Uh, and under the hood, it's implemented as a tree. So the uh, time complexity, if you're familiar with that idea, of the operations on a set are logarithmic uh, in time complexity. There's map, which is an ordered associative container like a dictionary in Python um, or a tree map in Java. Uh, again, the underlying data structure is a tree, so operations have logarithmic complexity. Okay. Uh, then there's unordered set, which is like a set, except that it's uh, a hash table under the hood. So operations uh, take constant time, but uh, iterating through them uh, is worse in time complexity. And unordered map, which is a hash table. Right? Again, constant time lookup, iterating is worse. Uh, okay, so speaking of iterating, uh, when you're trying to iterate over a uh, container, um, uh, what, you, uh, what you want is the ability to iterate over the container regardless of what kind of container you're using. You don't want to have to say, okay, I'm going to write some code that's specifically for lists or some other code which is specifically for maps, right? You just want to be able to write code that iterates over a collection and not care what type it is or what type of collection it is. And the way that you uh, deal with that is with something called iterators. So uh, an iterator in C++ is just a, a layer of indirection over uh, the container, uh, which allows us to start at the beginning of the container, uh, no matter what container it is, uh, and then move one step at a time through the container until we reach the end. Okay? Uh, and so the, the iterator is an abstraction which abstracts away the details of the underlying container uh, so that we can iterate over it. So, one thing we can do over here is uh, here we have a, an array of char. We could actually replace that with a vector. And this, here's how we do it. We'd say hash include vector, and if I can spell that correctly. Okay, now notice I've used angled brackets around the hash include instead of quotes. You use angled brackets when you're referring to the standard library. All right, you use quotes when you're referring to something in your own code, basically. Okay, so we hash include vector. And then what we're going to do is we're going to go down to our, oops, uh, what I actually need is the uh, compressor.h file. Uh, okay, so hash include vector. Okay, and then what I can do, let's make that quickly, I can go down here and I can replace this with std vector char. Okay, so now my workspace uh, is a vector, uh, not a, uh, an, a pointer to char. Uh, and in fact, now, now that I've done this, I don't need um, my constructor and destructor anymore because the vector handles memory allocation for me. So I don't need to do any memory allocation. The vector just does it all under the hood. Uh, but what I do need to do is I do need to go into the, um, uh, the code for the encode and decode methods and I need to use the methods on the vector class rather than accessing it as an array. So if I just I'll use the board because it's faster. Uh, with an array, okay, with an array, I would say, you know, uh, my array, let's call it AR, there we go, uh, ARR, square bracket, I equals some value, okay, with a vector, vector, I just say vector in place, back, uh, and then we give it the value. So that adds a vector value onto the back of the vector. Um, uh, and if it needs to, it will dynamically grow the vector to do that. Okay? So, uh, basically, uh, we can use the standard template library to get a whole bunch of different collection, 
classes uh, that have different performance profiles depending on what we need, whether we need uh, you know, fast appending on the end or fast insertion and deletion uh, or fast lookup. Uh, whichever uh, use case we have, we choose the appropriate uh, container class from the standard template library and we use that to write our code. Uh, okay, uh, now the other thing, the other really cool thing that's in the uh, standard template library is algorithms. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of algorithms in there which uh, basically implements the standard sorts of algorithms of computer science uh, that you've probably heard about and, and would like to use. So for example, there's the studded find function which will search through any container uh, until it finds a value that you specify, right? Or there's copy, which will copy elements from one container to another. Uh, or there's uh, reverse, which will reverse the elements. Uh, there's sort, which will sort them, and it's uh, n log n sort implementation. There's lower and upper bound, which do binary search for you. Um, so all of these algorithms are implemented in the standard library for you. And most of them use iterators. So if I've got a, a vector, so I've got a, a vector, vector, let's say a vector of integers, B, what I can do is I can say studded sort, and then I need to tell it where the vector starts. So I call the begin method of the vector, which gives me an iterator to the beginning of the vector. I need to tell it where to stop. I give it VN, which is an iterator, which is a sentinel, uh, which is, indicates the end of the vector. Okay, so we're saying I want to sort the vector from beginning to end. And there we go. That's how you would sort a vector using the sort algorithm from the standard template library. Okay? Uh, now, uh, it doesn't have to be a vector, right? Uh, it could be some other type, as long as it's, some, it's something that's sortable, and uh, the studded sort would just work, as long as it's got an iterator. Okay? So anything with an iterator uh, that can be sorted, studded sort can sort. Okay? All right, uh, okay, we have 10 minutes left. There's one other thing that I wanted to talk about uh, that's very important. So, um, I mentioned earlier that there's this problem with memory management uh, that you can really uh, easily get yourself into a situation where you introduce memory leaks into your code because you forget to free up some memory. Right? And a classic scenario would be something like this. We say uh, char star p equals new whatever. And then we do some stuff. Okay? And then we uh, delete p. Okay? So we allocate memory, we do some stuff, and then we delete it. Now, if there's some kind of error in this code, we might never execute this line, okay? And so we have a memory leak, okay? And uh, this is a situation that we want to avoid. And the standard template library has uh, some classes in it called smart pointers, which are designed to uh, protect you from this very scenario. There's two of them. The first one is unique pointer. So we can say studded unique ETR. Uh, and then we it's a template, so we have to tell it what it's a pointer to. Let's say it's a pointer to char. Okay. Uh, and then uh, we um, might give it some arguments here uh, to initialize the char or whatever. Okay, and then we do some stuff. And that's it. We don't have to call delete, or we don't have to have a delete statement. And the reason why we don't have to have a delete statement is because as a class, this unique pointer, as a class, it has a destructor. 
and the delete is implemented in the destructor. And the compiler guarantees that once this variable, uh, oh, I forgot to actually give the variable a name here. Okay. Once that variable ceases to exist, the destructor is called. The compiler guarantees that. Okay. So if there's an error in do stuff, or if there, even if there isn't, the variable p will go away, and the compiler guarantees the destructor will be called, the memory will be freed. So if you want to uh, allocate memory in C++, do not use the new operator. Use a uh, unique pointer. Okay? Uh, there is, in fact, a, a method called uh, studded make oops, unique. Uh, and you have to give it a, a type, some type here. Uh, and that will return to you uh, a unique pointer with the memory allocated for, for this thing. Uh, in fact, this actually just creates a unique pointer, so we have to give it a pointer. This one actually uh, allocates the memory for us. Um, the other one that uh, exists apart from unique pointer is something called shared pointer. So unique pointer is a pointer which there's only ever one copy of that pointer. So once the unique pointer goes away, the memory can be deallocated immediately. A shared pointer is one where there's multiple copies of the pointer. Okay, uh, so uh, you can have uh, a shared pointer which is a copy of another shared pointer. And the system maintains some metadata under the hood, basically a reference count telling us how many shared pointers there are uh, to this particular thing. And once that number reaches zero, the memory is deallocated and it's all done for us. We don't have to call delete ourselves. Okay, that's it. That was my whirlwind tour of C++. I hope that was helpful. Uh, I'll be around for a little longer if you'd like to ask any questions. Uh, thank you very much for coming and thank you for having me.